Hear from Lee High, who will talk about motivic geometry of two loop fine minerals. Okay, uh, thanks, Max. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come here and speak at this workshop. It's really it's been really nice so far. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming as well. Okay, so first, a couple of comments uh, about my title slide. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about the motivic geometry of two loop Feynman integrals. So, first of all, um, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, I mean, of course, this comes from uh, physics quantum field theory. I'm not going to say anything about that because I think the audience is, is divided into two groups people who know that part better than me and people who don't. Um, and the people who don't, I, I think you can just sort of think about this essentially the way I do is like a really nice problem uh, in Hodge theory or geometry coming from combinatorics. So that's the way I view this, this whole project. Uh, the second comment that I want to make about this is that I use the word motivic. Uh, so I mean this in a very loose sense. Uh, I basically mean Hodge theory when I talk about motivic uh, here. Okay, so uh, great. So with that out of the way, yeah, great, thank you. Okay, so I'll give some basic definitions first of all. So let's start with the graph, which I'll call gamma, and some integer, some positive, uh, even integer called the space time dimension. So for me, a graph is going to consist of, you know, the basic data. So you have your edges, your vertices, and your half edges. So I'll sometimes call these external edges. I mean, that's maybe the, the only modification you need to make here. Um, and so to each half edge, I'm going to associate with a uh, momentum. So this lives in a Minkowski space dimension D. So that's what the 1D minus 1 means. And these vectors will satisfy conservation. Right. So if you add up all the uh, momenta uh, coming into this graph, you're going to get zero. And so to each internal edge, we're going to associate a positive real number. So I'm going to simplify things a bit. So this is sort of the basic you know, starting point for this whole project. Um, so the simplifications are the following. So first, I'm going to view masses and momenta as complex numbers. So this is you know, just to make dealing with them via algebraic geometry a bit easier. I'm going to restrict to the case where I have no uh, one valent vertices on my graphs. Uh, this is just, again, a simplification that I can make. And um, I'm also going to look at only connected graphs today. And for each vertex, uh, I'm going to associate a single half edge. So in, in fact, like we can sort of drop the half edge condition. I introduced it and sort of dropped it uh, immediately. Um, and so I'm going to write, I'm going to associate the uh, momenta to half edge, to vertices instead of half. Okay. So these are justifiable simplifications. Okay, so once we have this data, uh, we can associate a bunch of polynomials. So these are called the semantic polynomials. So they live in the ring uh, of um, polynomials with uh, variables corresponding to the edges of the graph gamma. Um, so there's a U polynomial. So this is called the first semantic polynomial. So if I take a tree, a spanning tree of my graph gamma, so when I say spanning tree, I mean, take a tree inside of the graph. Tree is tree. Uh, spanning means I contain each vertex of the graph in my subtree, in my subgraph. And when I say this, I also mean that a spanning tree is uh, simply connected, so a single component. Uh, so there's a unique component to this, this spanning tree. So to each spanning tree, I can associate a monomial. This is what I'll call x to the t. And that's just the product of all variables corresponding to edges not in my tree. I can take the sum of these things, and this is called the first semantic polynomial, and I'll denote it U of gamma. So this is closely related, related to what's called the Kirchhoff polynomial of the graph, and that's obtained by taking, you know, taking the uh, condition here and just taking the product that is inside of the tree. So you can get this, this, this other sort of combinatorially interesting and important polynomial that way. There's another polynomial that I'll attach to this. So the first polynomial you'll notice has nothing to do with anything um, except the graph, right? There's just something about the graph. This has nothing to do with the other data that I had, these uh, masses and momenta. The D polynomial, uh, this has something to do with the masses and momenta, and it'll show up sort of in this, this stretching here. So we'll do the same thing. So I'll take a spanning two tree of my graph. So when I say spanning two tree, I mean a tree, so simply connected subgraph, um, which contains all 
uh, all vertices of the graph. So that's what spanning means here. And I want two uh, distinct components. So two uh, connected components, and I'll call that a spanning tree tree. So again, we can associate the same types of monomials to a spanning tree tree. So take the product of all uh, variables not in that tree tree. And we can take the sum attached to this uh, choice of tree. So for each two tree, I construct this this uh, this this this, this, this polynomial. Here. Okay, so the coefficients that I introduce here, these have something to do them with the momenta. These are the sum of all the uh, momenta coming into each uh, of the two trees, and then I take the square. So when I say square here, I mean take the scalar product of these two vectors with one another. And so by conservation momentum, the sum of the uh, momenta coming into one of these two trees and uh, one of these components and the other component, these are going to be the same. So the sum of things in here is the same as some negative the sum of things in here, but when I square those. Um, right. So this is the, the basic uh, setup. Okay. Great. So once I have that, I can find the polynomial that I'm really most interested in. So this is often called the second semantic polynomial. I'll call it F gamma associated to the graph. And so it's just the polynomial I get by taking U gamma, multiplying by this uh, linear term in terms of all edges. So here is where the masses appear in my polynomial. And I add V gamma. Okay. So a couple of comments about this polynomial. So the degree is equal to the loop order of the graph. When I say loop order, I mean first Betty number. So the degree of U is equal to the loop order of the graph. And that's basically because if I want to build a spanning tree out of the graph, I can just take a basis of loops and remove one edge from each of the uh, elements in the base. Similarly, if I want to get a, a spanning two tree, I can just take a tree, a spanning tree, and remove one edge. That'll be a spanning two tree. So that will tell me that the degree of the F polynomial, which is the same as the degree of the V polynomial, the U polynomial times linear plus P, is equal to the loop order plus one. Okay. So these are just homogeneous polynomials. So these are homogeneous polynomials. That's maybe the most important part um, in uh, this, this uh, ring of polynomials corresponding to it. So basic example. So this is uh, the, I don't know what this is called. So this is called a bunch of different things in the literature. You can see this is called, uh, I think we use sunset. Uh, I've seen sunrise, banana graph. I, I don't know, there's probably more. Um, bananas, high, so, high, so this one is sunrise. If it's high loop, it's banana. Okay, uh, okay. All right, so, so in this case, you can write the, the expression out nice and very easily, right? So if I want a spanning tree of this graph, it's just any edge. So I have a vertex here, a vertex here, outgoing edges, outgoing edge, and edges next. So a spanning tree is just any edge in this graph. And then you have the, so the complement is just the two edges that aren't in that spanning tree. So you get the product of those two uh, variables. Okay, so that'll be my spanning two trees, product of all, pairs of uh, variables corresponding to edges and a spanning, oh, sorry, spanning, sorry, spanning here. Uh, so a spanning two tree is just these two vertices. So in my formulation, it's, uh, a vertex is a tree. Um, so the only spanning two tree is the two vertices. So we can compute this, we get this F polynomial. So this is, maybe it's good to uh, observe that this is a nice cubic, uh, homogeneous cubic. So if I look at the vanishing modes of this, of course, I get a family of elliptic curves living inside of people. Uh, okay, so the Q should have been here. So Q is just my moment. Okay, so maybe another good remark to make here is that generically, I think for any, I think it's probably true that for any graph of loop order greater than one, except for this one, uh, the vanishing locus of these polynomials, the F polynomial will be singular. Uh, so this is important to note. The, I think it's something that took me a little while to really sort of realize that the sort of important thing to study here is the singularities of these graph polynomials. That's really sort of an important part. Um, so in some sense, I chose, you know, a bad example to demonstrate this, uh, but there are still, you know, bad things occurring in this example that we have to figure out in the test. 
Okay, so now once I have this, I can express, you know, a find an integral, which, okay, there's a constant here that's missing, but I'm just going to ignore that constant. Some expression in terms of gamma function. Um, so for me, this Feynman integral is just this integral here. So I have a rational differential form. I'm thinking about this as a differential form with, uh, or uh, uh, yeah, rational differential form on e to the e minus one. So this projective space. So I have my standard homogeneous differential differential. Uh, e minus one formula here. So this is a very standard thing if you think about any, you know, uh, residues on hypersurfaces and projective spaces and things like this. And you have this, uh, this cycle, well, not quite cycle, this is a relative cycle because it's just sort of the positive real uh, values in this projective space. So this is not, this is not a closed cycle. This is some, something with, with boundary on the coordinate hyperplane. Okay, so this is an integral. Uh, this integral doesn't make sense uh, for reasons that we'll see in a second, uh, and maybe I'll explain this. Um, but you can do, you know, formal manipulations, or basically there, there's a way to get rid of the fact that this doesn't actually make sense because the denominator of this differential form can blow up along this cycle. Okay, so I want to think about this as a period. I want to talk about Hodge theory. I want to talk about um, mixed Hodge structure. So first of all, I observed that this can be thought of as a uh, element in a Dram cohomology on the complement of whatever the boundary, whatever the denominator is. So this is denominator. In fact, this is a good thing to notice that the denominator of this form uh, depends on the dimension D. So the fact that I'm dividing by two here uh, is why I choose even dimension D. Um, of course, the most important, I think, uh, Dimension for physics is dimension four. Uh, but I mean, I, I'm fairly agnostic in terms of dimension. Uh, okay, so I have even dimension. I have a differential form. And depending on the dimension, the denominator can either be uh, the va vanishing locus of this F polynomial, the product of the F and the U polynomials, or the vanishing locus of the U polynomial. So for high dimension, I get the U polynomial, and low dimension, I get this F polynomial. So for me, uh, what's going to be important is the vanishing locus of the F polynomial. And this is mostly, well, okay. So one of the reasons I do this is that if I think about the U polynomial, this depends on no parameters. So this is interesting in its own way, but I'd rather stu study something that varies. Um, I mean, uh, secondly, is that the examples that I'm most interested in are graphs of with loop order two, so those are degree three hypersurfaces. Uh, if you look at the F polynomial, if you look at the U polynomial, those are just quadrants. So if you think about the homology of a quadrant, it's very simple. I mean, there's there's a complete classification based on the rank of the quadrant. So in some sense, if I want to study the U polynomial or cases where the dimension is high uh, for two loop graphs, I'm going to get a very simple answer, which is interesting in its own right, but I think I, I want to stick with the F polynomial. And so B here is, I guess I'm going to abuse notation a little bit, but this is just the torque boundary of projective. Okay, so obviously when I write this out, the B is sort of extraneous. Um, this is obviously an element in this Gram cohomology, but what I'm really interested in is integrating it over this sigma class. So this sigma class is almost an element in this relative homology group. I would like to pair these two things and think about the integrals uh, uh, in terms of that pairing, but this doesn't work because if I take the intersection of the sigma class and the vanishing locus of gamma, I don't get zero. So the integral blows. There's a nice theorem of block and O-Kramer. Uh, so block and O-Kramer do this in the case of B equals four and primitive divergent graphs. And then Brown has later work that does it more generally that says that what you can do is you can basically take a torque blow up of projective space. So the underlying projective space here, I'm going to call that P gamma. And I can take a modification of sigma. So it's not quite the proper transform of sigma under this um, flow, but it's you know essentially the proper thing to do to transform sigma under this flow, uh, so that the Feynman integral becomes well defined. So it becomes a relative period of this relative uh, mixed hot structure, of this relative hot. OK, so, so the. The Feynman integral is a period 
of a mixed hydrogen. This is really the point. Okay. So at the period of the mixed hydrogen structure, the canonical mixed hydrogen structure on this relative cohomology group after BOA. So I'm going to use the no same notation for the for for, uh, for the boundary here before blow up and after blow up. But what I really mean is I take the pre image of the torque boundary after some torque blow up. And so maybe just an example of what exactly happens in this case. Um, the thing I, to to do this blow up, I need to blow up the points one zero 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 one zero 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 one. So the torque uh, fixed points. So if I so if I think about the the vanishing local effect, it'll contain all of those torque fixed points, and after blowing that up, the integral becomes four to five. Okay, so this is a setup. Um, everybody's doing okay. Questions, comments, corrections. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yes. Right. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. I I, uh, I don't know the physics part of this well enough, but this is true. So yeah. So that's what I'm going to focus on now. So from my perspective. Um, what I want to do, so this is a, a relative mixed pod structure. Uh, but I mean, you can think about this. I mean, I'm not going to say exactly the words you're saying, but uh, this is this is an iterated extension of mixed pod structures coming from, well, the intersection of this hypersurface or the, this, this, well, if I take, what am I going to do? I'm going to take the intersection of this thing with the boundary, so the torque boundary. So if I take the intersection of that thing with the torque boundary, after doing the correct sort of manipulations, you see that the intersections look like, well, projective space minus a graph polynomial obtained by deleting some subgraph of gamma, or things that sort of come from contracting subgraphs of gamma. So this is something that uh, Brown works out. So the point is basically that these this is an iterated extension of mixed pod structures of this type. So if I want to understand this mixed hod structure and where it lives, it's enough to understand the mixed hod structure without the non-relative. So that's totally enough. And so that's what I'm going to do. And of course, the obvious statement is that if I want to understand the, the mixed hod structure of the complement of a hypersurface in projective space, that's up to mixed state factors or up to the state factor, uh, just understanding the cohomology of the hypersurface itself. Okay. So I want to study the mixed hot structure on the cohomology groups of these hypers. So, I mean, the, the whole philosophy here is, I mean, I could study the Feynman integral itself. I could think about that as a period. Um, but what I want to do is I want to think about these as periods of this mixed hot structure and then understand that space of period. That's essentially the idea. Uh, and secondly, as I mentioned a little bit before, I'm going to focus on the case where the polynomial uh, Z gamma D is just the vanishing locus of the epic. Okay. Uh, I'm going to break that. Uh, I'm not going to do that all the time, but for most of the time, this is I'll tell you when I don't. Okay. So, what is known? I'm going to say stuff about the mathematical literature uh, because I don't know the physics literature well enough for other people to explain it. But I'm just going to say what appears in the mathematical literature. So, here's a bunch of examples. So for the case of the wheel, so this is called the wheel with end spoke. So, we, uh, so this is studied by Block, Eno, and Primer. They show that the mixed hot structure that you get is mixed K. Uh, there is the sunset family of graphs, which is uh, also called the banana graph. Um, so these are studied in, I guess, lots of different works. I think um, Block, Kerr, and Van Ho have a sequence of papers where they study these things. Uh, I mean, other people study these things as well, but I think in the mathematical literature, that's what 
Uh, so in this case, maybe a good thing to point out is that if you take the graph hyperservices attached to this, these are degree n plus one hyperservices in Cn. So they turn out to be Calabi-Yau. So that's a very interesting fact, but those are the only Calabi-Yau uh, graph hyperservices vanishing modes I have F polynomials that you'll find. So if you want to think about Calabi-Yau directly, that's, that's, those, are, those are your friends. Um, there's also an example in the literature uh, corresponding to the double box. So this was worked out by uh, block. Um, so in this case, this is, so it's a degree free hypersurface if I take the vanishing locus of the F polynomial. So what's going to happen? Um, so it's a degree hypersurface. Uh, it's uh, a fivefold. So it's a cubic fivefold. And block shows that the fifth weight graded piece of H5 is isomorphic to the homology of the elliptic curve when the dimension is the physical dimension. Okay. So yeah, so it's sort of a, sort of a hidden clabby owl in that case, right? And that's sort of the you know the the theme here. The theme is you know except for the first case, we're, we're looking for hidden collabiaus. So we see obvious collabiaus here, and a hidden one. So maybe just to mention a bunch of other results. Um, so a general result of Bell, Kale, and Brosnan, which studies the motives of the U polynomials, says that there's in some sense general. Uh, I'll mention also that Dorin, not Duran, Dorin. Um, basically applied the same methods as blocking known primer to a family of graphs called the zigzag family of graphs. Get some nice results there, similar results. I'll mention because uh, in the audience, uh, so Clement Al uh, and lots of collaborators have studied the sunset graph and the ice cream graph. So, I mean, there's, uh, this is maybe breaking my rule about being in the mathematical literature, but it's close. Um, and I'll also break my, uh, the other rule about being in the literature by mentioning that, <laughs> Uh, Matt has a bunch of unpublished results about various two loop graphs. Okay, so, so soon to be. Okay, so close enough. Close enough. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> both rules are broken because of audience. <laughs> okay, right. So, how do I study these? So I'm. I'm so this is this is my background portion of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some results that we have. Uh, so this is uh, work with um, Chuck and Pierre Van Hoek. Okay, so here's like the basic motivating idea behind all of this. It's it's a very simple idea. I don't. I mean, I think. I don't know if I want to attribute this to me or even us. Um, but you know, I I I learned this from Pierre. So, um, so if I have a graph, a finding graph. And I have loop order greater than one, and I have a chain of edges. So when I say chain of edges, I mean something like this. So in the double box, I have an edge connected to another edge connected to another edge, and these are basically bidal and vertices connected. Right? So um, if I ignore external edges, these are connected by bidal and vertices. Uh, so if I have a chain of edges, then on the vanishing locus of the graph polynomial, I get a quadratic vibration over some projective space, and that's the projective space attached to the uh, edges that are not in the chain. So I get a projection. So in this case, this will be a, this will correspond to a cubic bifold with a quadratic projection, uh, projection, uh, sorry, a quadratic vibration onto P3. So you get like this nice geometric structure on these things. And this is not like, not every uh, cubic fivefold has such a structure. So this is sort of a special structure, which can also be seen as something that comes from the structure of the singularities of that. Okay, so this is just a general fact. You can sit down and prove it in you know, probably about five minutes or so. Uh, it, but it has sort of nice uh, consequences. So, I mean, basically the consequence of this is that, well, here's this proposition in quotes because it's not quite precise, but this is essentially the idea. It's that if I have a quadratic vibration, and so when I say quadratic vibration, I mean a map whose generic fiber is a quad. I don't need smooth quadratic fibers. I don't need anything like this. I just want them to have a generic uh, quadric as a uh, generic fiber being quadric. And I want to think, uh, I basically want to think about where these fiber, uh, these quadrics become more degenerate. Okay, so if my generic co rank uh, is R, um, and I let D be the divisor on, along which the co rank of the quadrics increases, then if the generic co rank is greater than zero, 
the middle dimensional cohomology is Nick Cato. So I don't have anything, well, interesting from my perspective, at least there. If my if my goal is to hunt down Slav Yaws, I'm not going to find something in this. So if the um if the co-rank is zero, so that is I have generically smooth fibers, uh, and the relative dimension is odd, then the mix, then the cohomology, the middle cohomology is basically determined by a double cover of B, the base. So that's in this case uh Pn. I guess I wrote this two different ways. So this should say Pn here. Uh, ramified along the screaming side. And if the co-rank is, uh, the, the co is generically zero and the relative dimension is, oh, I should say even, uh, then the middle dimensional cohomology is determined by the cohomology, the double cover of the screaming divisor B. So the point, I mean, forgetting all of this is basically that uh, the place at which this discriminant sort of exists, this the, the way, the place where the quadrics degenerate, uh, this is this is going to determine a lot about the cohomology. So if I have a quadratic vibration, I just want to look at the determinant mode. This is a relatively easy thing to compute if you have equations, so this is very nice. I should mention that, so I gave an expression for the Feynman integral uh, before. Um, and so, I mean, this is not maybe the, the most general expression for a Feynman integral, like there's lots of them in the literature. But the way that this is obtained is basically applying uh, essentially, you know, maybe a, a slightly different version, but a version of this trick to um, uh, the, the most general sort of expression of the This is a uh, schwinger. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. So based on this, these like little, you know, observations, essentially, we can get a bunch of things. So we can, first of all, see that if I take a graph like this, I'm going to call this an A11 graph. Um, then this is going to emit a quadratic vibration over P1. So I, I've drawn here, I guess this is a 411 graph. So four edges on the top, then I have one, then I have one. Uh, so this emits a quadratic vibration over P1. So there's a bunch of different cases. So first of all, if I make the dimension big enough, so that is the, uh, the space-time dimension becomes big enough, then I can force all the fibers to become singular. They all degenerate, which means that if I want to understand the, the middle dimensional cohomology of this thing, I just get something that's maybe. If my dimension is small, and I'll, I mean, I can make this precise if you want, but if I'll just say small and A is even, then again, the mixed hot structure is mixed tape because this is a quadratic vibration. Um, so maybe I'll say this in, in more, it'll come up here. If a uh, dimension is also small and A is odd, then what I get is a vibration, a quadratic vibration over P1. It's gonna have five singular fibers. One of these fibers is two copies of e, uh, e A minus something um, meeting in a point. So that's a degenerate quadric, a very degenerate quadric. And then four of these fibers are just nodal quadrants. So in this case, the cohomology of the hypersurface itself is essentially determined by the double cover of P1 ramified in those four points. So the four points corresponding to the nodal quadrant. And that just sort of falls out. So up to maybe some, you know, yeah. I, I don't do anything with that. No, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no regular technique. So fixed dimension, right? So, um, Let's see if I have examples. Yeah. 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 Okay. So this is my one example. I think I have a lot of bit of time here, so I'll continue with my example. So we have an ice cream cone uh, with n scoops. So if I take this graph, I have a chain of edges here. So I get a conic vibration, so a vibration by one dimensional quadrics over Pn minus one. And you can compute this. And the really interesting thing that comes out when you do this computation is that the discriminant locus is a, a union of two distinct sunset slab yaw n minus one. There's a little bit extra that I'm not saying, but it's essentially just slab yaw n minus one. So if I want to think about the cohomology of this thing, the cohomology basically comes from those two slab yaw n minus two, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I should say n minus two, sorry, n minus two fold. So if n is the number of, uh, 
Okay, so this is this is uh, something that's uh, also appeared in the literature and work of Durr, Clem, uh, Nega, and Tancredi. So they approach this, I think, from the perspective of period more than geometry, but I think the idea is the same. <clears throat> you can go up in dimension. Why not? I, I, I made up this name. I don't think anyone else uses this. So in our paper, I don't know if that's a general thing. But we call it like the uh, the observatory. If, it's, if there's no. OK. Yeah. Oh, OK. So anyway, whatever. Um, so you get a, a two-dimensional uh, quadratic vibration over Pn minus 1. You do the same computation, and it turns out to be the same. The discriminant locus is, again, a union of two distinct uh, sunset cloud out n minus 1 folds. And I got my um, <clears throat> n minus 1 folds. And in fact, in this case, uh, OK, so but, but in this case, it's a two-dimensional quadratic vibration. So you're getting something that comes from the double cover of Pn ramified in these two collab out. And what you can sort of see if you, if you do the computation is that what you get is a collab uh, n fold entering into the cohomology, the minus two bit. And so and the reason for that is that if I took the sunset graph here, I would get a double cover coming from the, the chain of one edge. So anytime you have an edge, you just get a double cover onto a projective slope. So from that double cover, you can present the uh, sunset collab out as a double cover of Pn ramified in the union of P collab out and minus P. All right, so you get sort of this, uh, this periodic iteration um, where you, know, you can just add any number of edges here. So I put two, I did one and two, um, but you can just add n here. And for uh, odd n, you get a motivic collab out. And for even n, you get two motivic collab So that's sort of a nice general easy application. And the last thing that I want to say is I want to talk about the tardigrade graph. So if I take the graph that I have here, so I have two edges, two edges, two edges. So this gives me a family of cubic four folds inside of P5. And taking one of these chains of edges, I get a conic vibration over P3. So the discriminant locus is up to a little bit of extra. This is a, a nodal cortic surface with uh, a long along with a hyperplane. Uh, so the motive uh, basically comes from the case of the OK, so in fact, in this case, this is maybe the, that that's that's probably not an interesting statement in this case, because this is a cubic fourfold. And cubic fourfolds, basically, if you look at the chronology, it looks like a K3 surface. So in some sense, this is generic. So what maybe is the more interesting thing is if you take any other loop graph with the same number of edges, so six edges, you don't get a K. So this is probably the best case. In the other case is actually you, you, um, you, uh, you, things are worse. So we did some computations. You can see that this is generically a card rank K3 of, uh, uh, straight K3 of card rank 11. Um, and you can do this more generally as well if you have an N, N, N hypersurface. So it's three chains of N, uh, edges along these things, you'll get sort of motivic collab out end. Okay. So sort of fun applications of a, of a little lemma. Now I want to spend maybe the rest of my time here talking about uh, theorem, a maybe more general statement. And I want to focus on what I'm going to call a time mean cubic. I think this comes from that as well. Uh, so this is the case where my loop order is two. And then my graph is of the form gamma ABC where A is the number of edges on the top, B is the number of edges here, and B is the number of edges. So the degree of this F polynomial is three. So these are cubics. And the degree of the U polynomial is two. So as I said before, in this case, it's not really very interesting to study the vanishing locus of the U polynomial. What's more interesting is this F polynomial. OK, right, so this is the statement here. Um, so what I want to understand is the vanishing locus. So if you dig into the physics literature, there's lots of computations around these things. Um, and lots of them sort of suggest that what you're going to get out of the fine minute fields attached to these graphs come from either elliptic curves or mixed state mixed particles. You see lots of elliptic functions, elliptic phi logarithms, and stuff going around when you do this. Um, maybe a sensible conjecture that uh, came from Block's paper about the double box is that if you take um, a graph like this, at least when one of A, B, or C is equal to one, 
you should basically come up with the thick curves. That was essentially what expected. Um, so since this isn't a mystery novel, the answer is to this question, like, is this actually going to happen? The answer is sort of, right? So if you restrict your, restrict your space-time dimension to four, uh, you actually do. This is actually true. If you let your space-time dimension get big, even in the double box case, you get curves of higher genes. But you still get curves. That, that's maybe the interesting part. So I want to explain this, uh, the following result. So let's suppose that B is equal to zero or one. Why did I choose B to be fixed? Uh, I don't know, look nicer. Um, so, I mean, this is basically, if you think about the graph theory of this, this is the same thing as saying like the, the whole graph with the half end edges is planar. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, this is not like a well drawn, but if I had zero edges in the middle, like, this is a very planar graph. So this is the case I want to think about. I don't know how, like, uh, in the cases that I'm considering, no. Yeah. Okay. So the th the theorem is that if I take the vanishing locus of so the the SAS polynomial, then this is contained inside of what I'm going to call MHS Q of height. So this is the extension closed subcategory of the category of mixed type structures generated by the cohomology of the hyperelliptic curves. So you have mixed state stuff in here, and you have the cohomology of hyperelliptic curves, and that's it. And they're extended. The next part of the result is that if I replace A or C, um, if I assume that they're less than or equal to two, then I can replace hyperelliptic with elliptic. In fact, in the case where uh, a or C is equal to one, we saw the easy proof of this already. That was the A11 one <clears throat> Um And if the dimension is large enough so that this uh, quadric vibration that I'm going to construct, if that degenerates, then I just get, get mixed state. So maybe more generally, we see that this Feynman motive, based on the reductions we talked about at the beginning of the talk, the uh, Feynman moto, so that is the, the relative cohomology group in which sort of the Feynman interval lives. That's um, contained in this category as well. So, I mean, if you want to think about this in sort of a down to earth way, this is just saying that if I can, if I compute the Feynman integral attached to one of these A1C graphs, then what I'm going to get is something that's built up from periods of hyperloptic curves and algebraic functions. The very, you know, the, the building up is the complicated process, but the build up is this is what we get. Okay, so I'll explain quickly a little bit about the truth of this. Um, so the first proposition is that if I have a cubic hypersurface and I contain a co-dimension one linear subspace, then the claim that I made is true. That's a fairly obvious thing to do. Basically, what you do is you take this linear co-dimension one linear subspace, you take the pencil of hyperplane sections passing through it, that'll give you a quadric vibration over P1 after blowing up along this linear subspace. Um, you have a quadric vibration over P1 and you apply stuff that we had to Easy. Um, so the observation to make, which is actually stronger than this, is that if you have a cubic hyper uh, equation of the type uh, A0C, so that is, so take that graph that I had and like make a bubble out of it in the top and the bottom. Then that vanishes along the linear subspace of co-dimension one. So that's great. We got the, that case easy. Um, but you can't really do the same thing when you have uh, A1C graphs in general. So they don't, well, I, I said they don't. They don't obviously vanish along the subspace of co-dimension. I wasn't able to find them. But you can play a trick to sort of uh, do essentially what you want with this. Uh, so you take a birational map, you construct this this new cubic uh, threefold or cubic hyperspace, sorry, called XA1C, and you build a birational map from the vanishing locus of that to that thing. And this is an isomorphism along two different open subsets, U and V, U and W. And this has the following uh, properties. So this new thing here, this contains a co-dimension one linear subspace. And the things that are removed are complements of hyperplane sections. And these are themselves cubics, which contain co-dimension one linear subspace. So I, I take out, I put back things, I, cubic, I basically build this, this uh, vanishing locus from cubics 
containing codimensional means. And so by standard arguments relating to cohomology of U and B, uh, U and W to X and V of F gamma, we can patch together the cohomology of the vanishing nucleus of F to get what we want. Right? So, I mean, this is just fairly straightforward stuff. You can, obvious stuff that you can find in my computer. Okay, so that's basically the proof. It's, it's not a particularly hard thing to do, but it, I mean, it, uh, you know, the, this step here required a little cleverness. There's a lot of other ways one can go about trying to do this, but you can't sort of obviously or like stupidly apply this uh, quadric vibration number that I had before. That won't get you there in an easy. So we had to take sort of this more sophisticated. Okay. Comments. I think I have about five more minutes. Yeah. So I want to say a little bit about another aspect of the motivation for studying this, which I think is maybe uh, related to the, I mean, this is this was Pierre's sort of uh, motivation, I think, and ours uh, by, because of that. Um, so Pierre and uh, Pierre Leray, uh, Leray, sorry, uh, were um, studying uh, Feynman and Phil's, or they were studying periods attached to pencils of graph hypersurfaces of this form. So you just stick a T in front of the polynomial, and you have this family of um, uh, differential forms, and you can try to compute the picard fuchs equation of that. Kind. Okay, so Pierre, Pierre Larez, he's got this really nice algorithm uh, that allows one to compute um, picard fuchs operators attached to singular half surfaces. So they did that. They computed a bunch of things. And once, I mean, so the reason for doing this is basically that if you can find a differential operator that this form satisfies, then you know that the Feynman integral up to some small lie uh, satisfies an inhomogeneous differential equation of this form. So this thing that annihilates the differential form here, this is going to not annihilate the um, Feynman integral, it's going to uh, be the homogeneous part of an inhomogeneous differential equation. Uh, right, so okay. Uh, so this was not done in general. This was done uh, for a specific example. Yes. Uh, okay. And so what they observed is that in these cases, uh, they found picard fuchs operators that came from families of elliptic curves, and they found they. I mean, these these operators they can factor them. They break up into different pieces, and um, so the pieces that they found came from the elliptic curve, so hypergeometric stuff. And there's stuff that came from uh, Louisvillian ODEs. So this means that the differential Galois group is uh, solvable. And I take this sort of as saying roughly that the different that the monodromy group, well, I mean, okay, that's the same thing as saying that the monodromy group is solvable. Um, it says something about the monodromy group being very simple. So th they, they did this because these are the things that one can access through like computational methods. Like this, this, this. This paper that they wrote is very computational. Um, so these are the things that one can check in like Maple. And so thinking about this more generally in terms of mixed hot structures, the solution sheet of this differential equation that they get, this is a sub quotient of the variation of mixed hot structure attached to this family of hypersurface. And so if I have a weight filtration on this thing, that corresponds to a factorization on this ODE. And the weight graded pieces are basically local systems corresponding to the factors. So the theorem that we get as a consequence of the bigger theorem that we talked about earlier is that the differential equations that Pierre and Pierre got, um, they must factor as things of the following type. So if I have an A1C graph, then the, the annihilating differential operator factors with finite monodromy. So, so it factors into pieces with finite monodromy. So that's essentially not exactly, but roughly saying you billion. And it factors into pieces, which are Picard Fuchs operators of hyperelliptic curves. Or, I mean, I should be careful and say, it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a, a hyperelliptic curve. I mean, it could be a factor of the OD annihilating periods of hyperelliptic curve. But in the elliptic curve case, it is exactly the OD. Oh, it, um, yeah, we don't know if it's a homomorphic differential. Like, I, I'm not. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, if this is your, if this is your bar for Calabianus. No, no. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one of the points here. I don't know. We don't know anything about this differential. It's just, there is something and we have an annihilating ODE. Um, okay. So I have about zero minutes left. Um, so do you mind if I take another seat? Okay. Uh, this is my last talk. Um, okay, so this is a comment that I made earlier, that if V is equal to four, then we only get elliptic curves for all A, B, A and C and uh, B equals. The second comment that I wanna make is something related to this paper of block that I mentioned earlier. So if I let my dimension be six and when I look at the double box example, if I take B less than or equal to two, then I only get rational curves. That makes the, Cubic degenerate enough that the height that the Hodge structure degenerates. If I take d equals four, then I get a family of elliptic curves. But if I take d to be six, then I get a family of genus d. So in this case, if I let d be six, in the first case where you know it actually can happen, um, I do get genus two curves appearing. So this is this is sort of a counterexample to like the, the expectation that we get elliptic curves or yeah elliptic curves in general. And the last thing I want to mention is that this theorem that I proved earlier, essentially for arbitrary A, B, and C, I think the same proof will apply. And basically we'll get a bound on the hot structure as well to right here. Um, so what are, if, for instance, if the minimum of A, B, and C is equal to two, then the hot structure on this, this, uh, this, uh, this hypersurface should basically come from surfaces or surfaces and curves. If I let the minimum be free, I should get uh, threefold surfaces and curves, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the the lowest of A, B, and C should give the bound on complexity um, for the motor. Okay, so that's all I had to say. No. Okay, questions for Andrew? I think uh, there, yeah. So, so do you know the nature of this inhomogeneity in, in some generality? No, no, no. I mean, like, there's obviously like these these death terms correspond to integrals on the boundary. That's right. So, but we haven't we haven't done but, any uh, computation in the in the in the in the physics literature. That's quite interesting. This is basically corresponds to the subgraphs. Yes, exactly. And, and so it's, you can actually uh, in most cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And 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 so to say for the. In this case, the sunset graph are super special because uh -huh. if you look at the su uh, subgraph, it's all tadpoles. Right. And therefore, there's no momentum integral anymore. That, right. That's why they are basically constant. Uh -huh. but, but in, for the in other generality, cases, like, these should be very complicated, these estimates, right? Yeah. I mean, so more generally, I think what you probably want to do is just get a bigger operator that annihilates the entire. Right. Yeah, yes. exactly. Questions? Any questions online? Not. Let's thank Andrew again.